Read Smart, the Bailey Gifford Prize for Non-Fiction podcast. This podcast is generously supported by the Blavatnik Family Foundation. Welcome to Read Smart, the official podcast of the Bailey Gifford Prize for Nonfiction. I'm Shahid Abari, academic, critic and host of the Read Smart podcast, standing in for regular host Razia Iqbal. The Bailey Gifford Prize celebrates the very best in non-fiction writing, from history and politics to nature and arts. We're immensely grateful to the Blavatnik Family Foundation for its generous sponsorship of this podcast. On the 24th of February, Russia invaded Ukraine. In the weeks since, we've heard horrifying stories of human rights abuse and families forced to flee their homes. Ukrainian forces, though, have managed to resist the Russian military, for now, whilst Western nations have expressed their support, sending relief to Ukraine and imposing sanctions on Russia. Today, we're extremely fortunate to welcome three guests to the podcast to discuss the conflict in Ukraine. Sahi Plokhi is a professor of Ukrainian history at Harvard, an author of a series of acclaimed books, including The Gates of Europe, A History of Ukraine, and of course, the Bailey Gifford Prize winner, Chernobyl. Sir Anthony Beaver is a multi-award winning historian of war whose book Stalingrad recounted the battle between Russian and German forces in Eastern Europe in the Second World War. It won the very first Samuel Johnson Prize, the precursor to the Bailey Gift Prize. His new book, coming this May, is Russia, Revolution and Civil War, 1917 to 1921. And Polly Jones. Polly is a professor of Russian at the University of Oxford and has written an introduction for the upcoming new Everyman's Library edition of Life and Fate, the masterwork of Ukrainian writer Vasily Grossman. The book was banned in the Soviet Union and only published in 1980. Thank you, Serhi, Anthony and Polly for making the time to join us on this very pressing subject. I wonder if we can start by thinking about the nature of this conflict in Ukraine. There's been considerable speculation about this being the start of a new Cold War or even World War Three. I, I wonder if this is hyperbole. In your opinion, as things stand right now, what is the magnitude of the events of the last few weeks? Is, is this a historical turning point? Anthony, perhaps you could go first. It's not often that turning points become immediately apparent, uh, but this is certainly one particular case partly because of the shock that we never expected to see uh, another World War style of fighting in uh, the Eurasian landmass. Uh, and especially after th- over 30 years of, uh, of peace. So from that point of view, yes, it's come as a shock. And it also looks as if it will uh, reorder or rechange the world order, as both uh, Sergei Lavrov and also uh, most of those in the West, I think, have acknowledged we are at a major point. Uh, and I think that there's no doubt about it that 2022 will be remembered as one of the key dates uh, of the 21st century. Polly, what's your thinking on this? Is this a historical turning point? I certainly agree, although I think uh, predictions are always very hard to make. But I certainly agree with what Anthony said about that sense of history instantly being apparent, that sense of a historical turning point. Certainly, as far as I think um, Russia more specifically um, goes the 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 nature of its relationship with um, all of the countries that border it, it has changed I think irrevocably um, and the nature of obviously the relationships with Ukraine um, in particular it's very hard to see how they will they will ever be repaired um, and more more generally the sense that you know the principle of territorial sovereignty having been um, uh, violated so so shockingly um, really does open up some very frightening possibilities, I think. It's, it's very hard to see, um, you know, where, where this might end. Mm. Say? Yeah, uh, there is no uh, doubt in my mind that we are witnessing the end of the era that started with the fall of the Berlin Wall. So the uh, hopes, the expectations, illusions that we had uh, are being gone, gone this, this month, February 2022. And uh, it's also quite clear that we are at the beginning of the new era with the return of the war uh, and uh, insecurity that comes with that. Uh, In terms of the Cold War, I think that the the parallels are really very clear. We can certainly talk about the new Cold War. It doesn't mean that it has to be exactly the same as the original one. Uh, 
But it's worth looking just at the uh, German decision to double the uh, defense budget and the Polish decision to double the number of the military uh, that mm, serves this country. If these are not the signs of the new Cold War, I don't know what, what, what would be those signs. Mm. It's, al it's always a very interesting question trying to work out whether a particular historical moment is going to be a turning point. As, as you suggest, Santi, it's not always immediately apparent. But, but listening to you, well, it seems to me that you clearly think that we do have cause to be concerned. But I, I wonder when we will know. Is there a particular signal event that will indicate the seriousness of what we're seeing, do you think? Polly, you were talking about frightening possibilities a moment ago. Well, of course, I mean, if Russia were to extend its ambitions into other territories, for example, or to or to use chemical weapons in Ukraine, as as clearly um, Joe Biden and others are worried that they might do. I mean, there's a number of different kind of escalations that would, I think, make it clearer um, what what the what the stakes are and the ways in which the West would have to get involved in in ways that they they aren't yet involved. Um, but it's, I mean, it's hard to it's hard to say really at what point it would become clear. Sahi, do you have thoughts on this? Uh, this is an excellent question because on the one hand, we, as Anthony mentioned, are uh, witnessing the, the 20th century, maybe sometimes even 19th century type of warfare. Uh, we are also in the age of cyber warfare. And uh, the, the law of war, as far as I know, is really not, not clear on that what, what uh, uh, is a cyber uh, attack. And we had already cyber attacks uh, coming from Russia against the member states of NATO. So the question is, what is where, where is the beginning of uh, war today and, and potentially global war and involvement of, of NATO is, is an open question. And that is one of things that worries me the most in comparison to the Cold War that we all survived. With the old Cold War, at least by the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, there were maybe not always written, but quite clear red lines and, and laws of, of, of conduct, so to say. Here, we are really in uncharted waters. So maybe, maybe there will be no just one event or one clear sign that would uh, really start that, that escalation. But once escalation starts, it would be very difficult, very difficult mm. to stop it. Well, we, we are in uncharted waters, but perhaps it might help us to think about some charted waters, perhaps to think about history. Anthony, you wrote a brilliant account of the Battle of Stalingrad, which was one of the longest and deadliest battles of the Second World War. And in that book, you, you, you demonstrate how by the time of the Nazi invasion, Stalin had politicized and purged the leadership of the Red Army. Are there parallels between Stalin's sabotage of his army and, and the current Russian army's struggles in Ukraine? Well, one is always, um, as a historian, uh, asked to predict the future. And yes, uh, yes. history, of course, it's not a predictive mechanism, but we can certainly learn from it. What we are seeing, of course, is that uh, Putin's Russia is not the Soviet Union and Putin's army is not the Red Army. Uh, and it's quite important to see the differences. Um, also, um, Stalingrad um, revealed the Red Army learning its lessons. Uh, what is fascinating is we're seeing, in fact, how Putin's army has forgotten or ignored all of the lessons that its predecessors learned. Um, one's got to look much more, for example, at the Battle of Berlin in 1945, mm -hmm. when Marshal Zhukov, under intense pressure from Stalin, started sending his tanks into straight into Berlin, uh, his tank army. Armies. And uh, rather like uh, Putin was sending his tanks into Kiev, um, what they were doing was actually they were so terrified of the anti-tank weapons that they were putting bedsteads and all the rest of it on top of their tanks. They did this again in um, entering Kiev. And in fact, actually, it was attracting the Ukrainian tank hunting parties, uh, just as it attracted the SS and Hitler youth of Panzerfaust parties in Berlin. So they're making very similar mistakes, rather as they also made a mistake with uh, uh, entry 
into Prague in 1968, having told their soldiers they were welcomed as liberators, uh, only to find they were cursed, and then they ran out of food and fuel. But but um, they can also still learn, and we are seeing at the moment that their redeployment uh, and their switch from opportunistic tactics, uh, which have proved disastrous, towards a much more coherent strategy may start, I'm afraid, changing uh, the course of the war uh, rather more in, uh, in the Russian favor. But... Um, as I say, one's got to be careful about these historical parallels. But we have also seen the way that the uh, Putin's army has also been corrupted, uh, as has most of society. And this has actually been one of the reasons behind uh, their weaknesses, uh, especially in logistics and a whole lot of other uh, mm -hmm. of other areas. But of course, yes, Stalingrad is the great iconic moment for uh, memories of that particular struggle. But Polly, we do have to be careful of historical parallels, as Anthony suggests. But I want to ask you about Ukrainian history. You've written the introduction to Vasily Grossman's novel, Life and Fate. And, and Grossman was born to Russians in Ukraine. And prior to writing the novel, he was a journalist on the front lines of Stalingrad. He's an important voice in Ukrainian history. Can you tell us more about why that is and, and what his resonance today might be? Yes, of course. I mean, we, we of course, we think of Vasily Grossman as, as a Russian writer, and he did write in Russian, and he, he made his literary career in Russia. But as you say, he had many connections to Ukraine. He was born in the town of Berdichev, um, and his mother died in that same town in Ukraine in, in the Holocaust in the early part of, the, uh, of World War II. And Grossman also spent um, quite a bit of his early career uh, in Ukraine, especially working uh, as a chemist in the Donbass. And he also, in that time, witnessed some effects of collectivization um, in Ukraine and the Holodomor, the, uh, the effects of the terror famine as well, which he wrote about in his last novel, um, Forever Flowing. But in, the, in, in Life and Fate, and indeed to some extent as well um, in its uh, prequel novel, which was actually published in the Soviet Union just before Stalin's death, um, we see in both novels a real concern actually with, with the fate of the, of, of the Jewish population of the Soviet Union, and in particular um, with uh, the Ukrainian uh, Jewish population. So one of the key storylines of both sort of Stalingrad novels um, unfolds around a Jewish scientist who's under pressure from um, Stalinist ideological controls and anti-Semitism, and he's based on a, a Kiev scientist called Lev Strum. Um, and also, especially in Life and Fate, we see a very detailed narrative of, uh, which is based very closely on Grossman's mother's um, death in Berdichev in 1941. And that whole storyline, which is much more kind of indirectly touched upon in, in um, the first novel, Stalingrad, I think uh, both in both novels, it really reflects Grossman's um, experience of belatedly finding out about his mother's death in Ukraine and his guilt about feeling as though um, he abandoned her um, to that. But maybe more importantly or more broadly, um, and again, especially in Life and Fate, we find a really powerful condemnation of Russian chauvinism and exceptionalism. And Vasily Grossman was a, a passionate cosmopolitan in the best sense of the word. And I think one of the core points that Life and Fate makes as a novel is that a war that was fought, of course, in the name of freedom and against Nazism actually ended up um, abetting nationalism, chauvinism, anti-Semitism in the Soviet Union itself. And so Stalinism and Nazism became much more similar to one another than one would imagine from, from this kind of global struggle. And then just finally, in terms of contemporary um, relevance, of course, as you said, the, the novel took a, a, a long time to be published. It wasn't actually published in Russia mm. until 1988. Um, but now it's very well known. It's 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 very well read, very popular um, work. It's been made into a TV series actually quite recently. Although it's possible that it'll become more controversial again now. I think, but right. um, but it has been translated into Ukrainian. Um, it's very acclaimed there as well. Um, there's a book prize named after Grossman there. But I'd say compared with writers like Gogol or Babil, there's still much, I think, to be analysed about you know to what extent Grossman is a Ukrainian writer or thought mm. of himself in that way as opposed to a Russian or a Jewish writer or some combination of, of those. I think those distinctions are going to become more and more interesting and contested, aren't they? Sahi, yeah. I want to ask you a little bit more about Ukrainian culture. I, I, I think for, for some of us, it might 
might be easy to forget that Ukraine is a relatively new state. It, it achieved independence from the Soviet Union in 1991. Can you give us a historical overview? How, how far back do we have to go to find a distinctive Ukrainian language and culture? Um, Ukraine uh, acquired its independence uh, in 1991 as part of the disintegration of the Soviet Union. In fact, one week after Ukrainians voted for independence, 92% of those who took part in the referendum supported independence. One week later, the Soviet Union fell apart. So that importance of Ukraine for the Soviet story uh, is is there and it resonates today because any reestablishment of the Russian control over the post-Soviet space would be incomplete at least without Ukraine, which uh, was the second largest Soviet republic after Russia. Uh, in terms of the roots of Ukrainian independence, culture and language, uh, 1991 was the fifth time when the Ukrainians declared their independence in the 20th century. So it was fifth attempt. Uh, the uh, Ukrainian um, uh, anthem uh, sings about uh, the uh, Cossacks of the 16th and 17th mm. century as forerunners of contemporary Ukrainians. And uh, the Ukrainian coat of arms uses the coat of arms of the uh, princess of Kiev, so going back to the medieval times. Language is probably the most primordial thing that one can, uh, can imagine. Uh, the, the linguistic data shows that the areas in northern Ukraine, southern Belarus, and eastern Poland were the original homeland of the Slavs. So it really, it's really goes deeper than, than written history. But the modern language, the literary language, as it is the case probably with every mm, Central European or East European country, it's a product of the late 18th and the uh, 19th century. That's where the, the literary language, uh, either it was Ukrainian in Ukraine or Russian in Russia, started to replace the Church Slavonic or some forms of, of, of Chancellor of the Church Slavonic that was used as literary language. So um, Ukrainian modern national pro uh, product, modern, uh, modern culture, it's uh, uh, the result of the 19th century so-called national awakening, but the roots are going deeper again mm. to the 16th century to the the medieval era and even to prehistoric times. That's absolutely fascinating. And I'm, I'm, I'm particularly interested that in, in the 19th century that, that Russia sought to suppress the, the distinctive Ukrainian language. Can you, you tell me more about that? What, what was the nature of the threat that you, you, the Ukrainian language seemed to represent, do you think? Uh, well, uh, starting in 1863, uh, the Russian Empire introduced a number of measures. The, the decrees that were either um, issued directly by the emperor or approved by the imperial office. And those decrees prohibited publication in Ukrainian uh, primers, for example, or Bible, or religious texts. So the idea was to arrest the development of not just Ukrainian literary language, but Ukrainian national project, Ukrainian culture, Ukrainian nation as such. And uh, uh, that was, that was the, the key goal. The idea was to create out of Ukrainians, Russians, and Belarusians one big Russian nation, uh, where maybe there would be some mm, mm, dialects, uh, but, but there would be one common uh, literary language and one common culture. So uh, the idea was to deny, uh, first of all, the existence of separate Ukrainian culture and language and to uh, stop the development of the Ukrainian national project. And we see this uh, now being resonated or repeated even word to word in uh, Vladimir Putin's pronouncements. Because when he talks about Russians and Ukrainians being one and the same people, what he means is not that uh, Russians are Ukrainians. What he means is that Ukrainians either don't exist or don't have the right to exist as a separate nation. 
Mm. So this this claim and what is now decided on on the battles of the of uh, on the battlefields of Ukraine is is really uh, the, the fate of this old imperial mythology and the fate of the old imperial policies that go back to mid 19th century. Thank you. Uh, Anthony, when we think of 19th century Russia, the the Russia of Pushkin and Tolstoy, I, I think we might Im- think of a, a Russian idealism and a, a longing for freedom, something um, that was crushed by the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 and some would say the regimes afterwards. Why was that lost? This was like a huge question, but 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 why was that lost? I think that already the surge of optimism after the February Revolution uh, started to dissipate very, very quickly because one found that the uh, the intelligentsia, who was such a tiny minority, um, that the ideals of freedom, of democracy, and all the rest of it um, were at risk right from the start. The trouble was that uh, there was the great phrase of Hudson, you know, the pregnant widow. The moment you'd overthrown the Tsarist government, there was going to be this awful waiting time before a new regime would emerge. And the provisional government, having promised the constituent assembly, um, couldn't do anything until uh, all the decisions had to be awaited until the constituent assembly had been set up. And this, of course, gave the Bolsheviks the chance. Uh, They couldn't oppose it to begin with, uh, but they destroyed it as soon as it met. Um, And I think what we see is that uh, the whole idea of uh, liberalism, of freedom, uh, was totally vulnerable to the single-minded determination of the Bolsheviks to impose their great experiment, what Viktor Shklovsky uh, referred to or called really the devil's apprentice after an old Russian folktale that the devil's apprentice said that he could rejuvenate an old man by setting him on fire and then, of course, found that uh, he'd killed him. Um, And this, of course, was, I think, the tragedy for that particular freedom. But just to add very quickly to what Serhii was so brilliantly describing of the Ukrainian nationalism, one has to remember that this program of Russification uh, under under the Tsar, and particularly under Nicholas II, uh, towards uh, uh, at the beginning of the very beginning of the century of the nineteenth century of the twentieth century, uh, also accelerated um, Finnish nationalism, and mm. of course led to the Finnish civil war, which turned out to be a very much more successful successful one in achieving uh, liberation and then, of course, Ukraine, which was going to be uh, the, one of the main battlegrounds of the civil war. Yes. And the question of the repercussions of the current conflict is one that we must think about too. But but for a moment, Polly, I wanted to ask you about the, the year since 1991 in Ukraine and in Russia. We've been talking a little bit about the 19th century, but I want to think a little bit about the year since 1991 and the emergence of of democracy and what we might call civil society in in both Ukraine and Russia. And I I wonder if the events of recent weeks now will compel us to look back on that post-1991 period differently. Yes, I mean, certainly, I I, I think I'd... it makes more sense for me to talk to the to the Russian case and perhaps leave Ukraine to to Serhii as a, as a much greater expert on that. But I think certainly um, those of us who've been you know, observing Russia for you know some time since 1991 have gradually come to realise, and I think actually since the start of the 2010s probably um, that many of us misinterpreted the um, the peacefulness of the Soviet collapse or what um, Stephen Kotkin called it Armageddon averted, um, and also misinterpreted the direction that, that Russia was moving after it. Um, and in terms of the, the sort of thinking through those sort of long term effects of the collapse, I, I keep thinking in recent weeks about a very prescient book by the uh, the Guardian journalist Sean Walker um, from a few years ago called The Long Hangover, which traced a kind of post imperial trauma um, through the 90s and especially uh, in the Putin era. And one of the things that um, we know is sort of driving Putin's broader project, I think, is a sense of wanting to avenge the the, the humiliations of the 1990s and the the sort of after effects of the of the Soviet collapse, the perceived loss of superpower status, and that ultimately this manifests not just in in a kind of rhetoric about um, needing to reacquire that status, but also, of course, in neo imperial thinking, and eventually then in conflicts such as those in Georgia or Crimea in 2014, and of course now 
what's happening, what's happening now. Um, and if I may just ask for the direction that Russia took after um, 1991, mm -hmm. or maybe even after 1985 or six with the, with the dawn of Glasnost and Perestroika, um, it now really does seem, and I think it has seemed for a few years actually already, that many of those moves towards democratization and civil society um, and pluralization, they now all appear a lot more sort of fragile and vulnerable than I think we, we all hoped or realized. And of course, there was a huge flowering of independent media and NGOs from, from the late 80s onwards. And a lot of that lasted um, you know, well into the Putin era, but especially from about 20. 11 onwards with the um, the rise of the protest movement in Russia, there's been almost, I would say, an inexorable trend to shutting down more and more media outlets, putting more and more pressure on NGOs, such as Memorial, the kind of flagship anti-Stalinist um, organization, which was recently liquidated by the authorities. But even so, I think in the last few weeks, in the run-up to the uh, the outbreak of war and in the last few weeks since since the war broke out, there's been another sort of drastic um, acceleration in, in the shrinking of independent media outlets and, and NGOs. So in recent weeks, we've had the closure of the one of the last uh, independent TV stations, RAIN, uh, radio station, Echo of Moscow. And there's only really a, a, a very small handful now of independent media left, like Nova Gazeta mm. and Producer. Um, and of course, then mean, meanwhile, the scope for protest and, and opposition, um, either of a mass protest or sort of various protest movement, has become dramatically um, less as well. And even just today, um, Navalny has been um, sentenced to another nine years in prison. Um, and this just gives a sense, I think, of just how much of this kind of repression is unfolding just day on day, hour on hour um, in Russia at the moment. Mm. Sahi, can you talk to that? that the Ukraine in that post-1991 period? Sure, sure. Uh, I'll start with Russia, because Russia uh, really in the late 1980s and 1990-91 was really a beacon of, of uh, democracy and pro-democratic pro mobilization. So the, the defeat of the coup is very much the work of uh, Boris Yeltsin and, and certainly the Russian pro-democracy forces that united around um, him. And the question is what, what really happened in Russia. And uh, I certainly agree with what Pauli had to, said, to, to, to say. Um, uh, there were numerous reasons, but uh, if you look at the origins of today's Russian state, I would not put it in the year 1991, but two years later, 1993, when the uh, Russian tanks uh, loyal to President Yeltsin fire at the Russian parliament. And the constitution is being rewritten, so the constitution that very much helped uh, Vladimir Putin to solidify his power. So um, that, that, for me at least, is symbolic and of, of uh, Russian um, democratic experience and the, the, rise, the rise of authoritarianism that now is really born in tyranny. Uh, Ukrainian case turned uh, out to be very different from Russia, and it was very difficult to, to imagine that actually it would go that way back in 1990 or 91 when Russia was leading as a pro-democratic force. Uh, Ukrainians turned to be uh, really committed to the, to the democracy as really the only way for their state to function, the state that is um, multi-ethnic and, and, and multinational and um, the state that formed the, the political nation that now very successfully resists this uh, Russian, uh, Russian attack. Um, Ukraine turned out to be um, a little bit an um, outlier in the, in the uh, post-Soviet history because most of the uh, Soviet republics uh, followed Russia or even Russia followed them in, on this uh, path toward authoritarianism. Uh, when Ukraine stayed, uh, stayed democratic, unlike Belarus or Russia for that matter, there were two attempts in Ukraine to establish some form of uh, authoritarian regime. And both of them ended with uh, popular uprisings. The Maidans, the, the first Maidan of 2004 and the, the second uh, Maidan, the second protest in the center of Kyiv in 2013 and 2014. 
Uh, uh, so those attempts at authoritarian takeover of the state were defeated and uh, Ukraine, it is very clear now, learned how to, how to live under democracy and how to be united under democracy. So it's, it's a, one of the very few very inspiring stories despite the tragedy of, of the, the, this, these days that we are living through, the inspiring stories of the democratic the survival in the place where many flirted with democracy, but very few democratic state, states actually um, can be found on the map today. And, and do you think that history of resistance to authoritarianism will hold Ukrainians in good stead now? Uh, well, uh, one thing that that is certainly clear today is that um, there is a commitment uh, to um, the, the, the values of democracy, there is a loyalty to the state, uh, and uh, a commitment to the, to the model of nation uh, where people can speak uh, different languages, at least two languages, mm. maybe more. Because Russian invasion came to Ukraine, it didn't come this month, it started in 2014 with the annexation of the Crimea, mm -hmm. the war in Donbass. It came with the idea that if you speak Russian and good part of the population of Ukraine in south and eastern parts of, of the country uh, speak Russian on a daily basis. So the, the model was if you speak Russian, you are Russian, you, you, you are supposed to, to be loyal to Russian state. and. Ukrainians uh, mobilized and survived and continue to fight back, uniting across this linguistic and, and other lines. So really the, the uh, lines in terms of culture and language that were drawn on the map of Ukraine for so long time don't, don't matter, at least don't matter much today in today's mm -hmm. war. You can see the uh, uh, citizens of occupied uh, by Russia cities and towns, uh, Russian-speaking cities and towns like Kherson, like Melitopol, marching uh, under Ukrainian national flags against the Russian tanks. So that is that is something that uh, that uh, on the one hand is, is of course heartbreaking, but it also tells you that, uh, well, those people, they're not afraid. Mm. Those people, they know who they are. They know what they want, and they know very well what they don't want. They don't want Russian aggression mm. and, and, and Russian troops and, and, and Russian uh, um, um, current uh, government and, and mode of government on their land. Mm. Shall we talk together a little now about Russian imperialism. It seems to me that's what we're talking about. Is it is it distinctive? What kind of empire was the Soviet Union? Anthony, perhaps I can come to you. Um, I think that there's something always very retrospective in uh, Russian imperialism. Um, I am very interested to hear what um, Sergei has to say, but I'd have thought that a lot of it goes back to those ancient obsessions of the Mongol invasion and all the rest of it, this feeling that the world is against Guinness, Russia contramundum, um, and therefore the feeling that they need to expand to protect themselves. It's rather like a, a rich man being terrified of becoming bankrupt overnight and feeling that they've got to accumulate yet more, yet more money. Um, and we've seen this, I think, very much in the whole of that 19th century extension, uh, certainly towards the east, uh, into Siberia, Central Asia, and so forth. Uh, all those wars, those colonial wars, which, which Russia fought. Uh, and this mentality uh, has run very, very deep, I think. Uh, and it still affects Putin. I mean, Putin's uh, obsession with history, uh, however grotesque and self-contradictory it often is, um, is it really does, I think, um, influence his uh, his thinking profoundly. Um, it's not just an excuse um, to um, control, if you like, what he sees as a potential threat, i.e. the very fact of Ukrainian democracy, of Ukrainian uh, respect for international order and all the rest of it. Um, that, of course, is mixed up in it. But he really does feel uh, that there is this whole nation of sort of uh, 
this whole notion of Russian control, uh, which is uh, which is needed. Polly. Yes, I mean, I, I, I echo very much what Anthony was just saying about this sort of obsession with history that's not just Putin, of course, but also advisors of his, such as Medinsky and Piskov, who all of whom are, are really genuinely um, interested in history, but also really seek to instrumentalize their version of history um, in, 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 with tragic consequences, as we can see now. And of course, part of that is, is, a, is a very long history, historical narrative of how they see the relations between Ukraine and Russia stretching back centuries. But also we've seen over the last few years, a real tendency to um, model contemporary events on World War II specifically, down to very specific references. And of course, we see that in um, this project of, of so-called uh, the need to denazify um, Ukraine and this this sort of idea that um, uh, you know that there, there are Nazis in Ukraine and that this, this is something that needs to be combated um, now as as it was in the past and um, so I think that there's a sort of very powerful World War II narrative that's that's often used in a sort of analogizing way for for contemporary situations and overlaid onto that a much longer narrative of the relationships between Ukraine and Russia and and Russia's right to kind of subsume Ukraine within itself. Mm-hmm. Sahi? Uh, first of all, I, I want to, I want to echo Anthony and Polly in terms of that there is a lot of misuse and abuse of history and a lot of uh, this this unhealthy fascination with this history on the part of Putin and, and his advisors. Um, I want to add to that that there is also a lot of history uh, in, in what is happening now today because one way to look at this, at this war is to look at it as a basically continuation story of the story of the fall and disintegration of the Russian Empire. Because it started in 1917, the Bolsheviks managed to put that empire together under the new banner and and new principles, accommodating in particular the cultural cultural demands of uh, national groups and nations like Ukraine. And uh, uh, now we see um, a return of, of imperial thinking to Kremlin and attempt to reestablish control over the the space that once was the Russian Empire and then was the Soviet Union. Uh, That being said, um, Putin is not a great fan of the the Soviet Union, and you can certainly hear that in his his war speeches. There was a number of them, and in in the essay on history that he published uh, uh, last July, in July of uh, 2021, uh, there is there is grievances against Lenin that Lenin allegedly created Ukraine. Um, so um, th- there is really a return to pre-Soviet mode of thinking about, about the empire and imperial space and, and organizing uh, uh, that space uh, again, the, we all hoped that the, the, the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, again, Polly mentioned uh, Armageddon averted, that it was a peaceful one. Uh, now we see that the, the conflict, the conflict was just, just moved in time by, by 30 years. We know where the history of empires end. We know what happens no matter how much they try to preserve their their control over over territories, their existence as imperial powers. Uh, And and that's that's where I'm absolutely sure the Russian current aggression will end historically. Mm -hmm. But the question is what is happening today, what what, what will be happening tomorrow? And that's uh, the the, 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 the tragedy that comes with that, the loss of life. Can that I, is maybe something that is difficult to, to really uh, think about purely in academic terms. Yes, I, 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 I think that's a very important point. I, I, I want to ask you how you, you, you feel uh, about the Russian possession of Chernobyl. You, of course, won the Bailey Gifford Prize in 2018 for Chernobyl. And it, it, uh, perhaps this is not an academic question, but I, I wonder what that, that must have felt like for you to, to have watched that unfold on the news in the recent day, weeks and days. 
You 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 almost uh, look at that and and you wonder whether this is this is just some sort form of a nightmare that you will wake up and and it will not be there. It's it, it's almost real. And uh, this takeover of Chernobyl symbolically is is basically as important in a different way, of course, as the the accident that happened uh, back in 1986. Because th there is a um, one thing that unites, that, that brings together, connects these two events, and this is this is complete disregard for for safety, and at the end, disregard for human life. Because uh, the uh, waging war on the territory of the nuclear site, like Chernobyl, and then later shelling the uh, Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, the largest nuclear power plant in Europe, like it happened in early, in early March, uh, that, uh, that, that is, first of all, unprecedented. Never in, in the history we had the war being waged on the territory of the nuclear power plant, nuclear site. Uh, but it's also a form of, a, of a, um, nuclear, nuclear terrorism. So to a degree, the war in Ukraine already went nuclear in, in, in a very particular way, uh, presenting a threat not just to the uh, people of Ukraine, not just troops on the ground, whoever those troops are, but we know, we learned that from Chernobyl that the radiation doesn't recognize borders, international or otherwise. So uh, the, the, the war uh, on the nuclear power site, site uh, on the site of the nuclear power station, this is, this is a direct challenge to the world as a whole, mm. and Europe in particular. Uh, Anthony and, and Polly, I, I think Sahi is right to remind us this is not an academic exercise, but I, I wonder if it, it, it can be illuminating to, to think about the parallels and perhaps the distinctions between the Soviet Union and the Russia of today. Are, are there parallels that should alarm us? Are there, are there distinctions? Um. I would have said that there's a, a distinct similarity in one particular way, and that is uh, an utter contempt, an utter pitilessness towards their end people as well as towards their enemies. Uh, we see this also in the way that, for example, that they were bringing in their mobile crematoria uh, to dispose of their own casualties so as to reduce the body bags going back to uh, Russia. Uh, in a similar way, um, even in 1945, there were mutinies in the Red Army at the way that they had been treated, forced to go into no man's land and strip their dead comrades of their uniforms so that they could be recycled and handed on to others. And this profoundly disgusted the uh, and horrified the soldiers who had to do this to their dead comrades. Um, it is that dehumanization which I think uh, does link the two, even though, as I said earlier, you know, the Red Army and uh, Putin's army are different, and the uh, Soviet Union and Putin's uh, Russia uh, are very different in their own particular way. Polly? Yes, I completely agree with that. I suppose I've, I've been thinking a lot um, over recent weeks about various parallels, actually, with with um, Soviet phenomena, um, and I think there are a number. I mean, I think one one very interesting one is, especially actually in the last week, um, this increasing number of references to or analogies with the, the Great Terror of 1937 to 1938 amongst Russian intelligentsia, um, who, you know, this has often been a, a reference point whenever really in, in Soviet times as well, whenever the regime seemed to be kind of going back towards a more conservative or repressive position. And it's really, um, there's been a real uptick in uh, references and analogies with, with the Great Terror, um, especially since Putin made his speech last week accusing anti-war opposition of various kinds of being a fifth column. Um, and of course, this broader rhetoric, which we've been discussing already about um, encirclement and external threats and Nazi threats outside the borders is also obviously very reminiscent of, of Stalinist um, rhetoric. Um, and But a, another parallel that I've been finding really um, interesting, probably from the point of view of my own um, research interests is is the parallels with with Soviet censorship and restrictions on on free speech and how those rules were negotiated and navigated then then and now um 
And of course, there's been, again, earlier this month, have been uh, new restrictions introduced um, in the in the criminal code, forbidding not just criticism of the war or fake stories about the war, um, but also even calling it a war as opposed to a special operation, which is the official term um, being used within Russia. And even actually the act of holding up a blank piece of paper can mm. be enough to have you bundled off by by the police very quickly and arrested. And in any in, in all of those cases, people um, propagating the wrong narrative of war or even calling it a war or even just standing up in public uh, and seeming as though they're about to say something about the war. All of those are liable for um, hefty fines and uh, in some cases prison terms as well. And of course, this idea of kind of making certain terms or references to particular events or catastrophes, including wars, is very reminiscent of um, of Soviet censorship, although the, the, mm. the censor would have kind of removed those references prior to publication. Um, and the, the other interesting thing, I think, is how these remaining pockets of independent media, which I mentioned earlier, are navigating this. And of course, all of them quite understandably are, are now, you know, do not want to put their journalists at, at risk of um, prison sentence. But what, um, for example, the newspaper Novaya Gazeta, which is doing some excellent reporting about the war is doing is that it's not using the word war, but when it when it doesn't use it, it's putting either blank space or asterisks mm. in place to draw attention to the fact of censorship. So again, these are, you know, very su- sort of subtle ways, but ways that anyone reading that would understand that this is a reference to this very repressive um, censorship, which is descending. I think what is a very important question is, why did we not see this coming? And I think there is a parallel here, which is an important one, which is that in the 1930s, both the British and the French uh, simply believe, could not believe that anybody would want another world war just as Hitler wanted it. And this is why they were not prepared at Munich, they were not prepared psychologically in any way for uh, the Second World War during that particular period. And I think it was a similar thing, especially after all those years of peace after the Second World War, not during the just the Cold War, but even afterwards, uh, the belief that the uh, the idea, the very uh, suggestion that we could have another war, as we're seeing now in this particular way, was simply beyond people's imagination. Uh, and this is why it has come, I think, as such a shock. There were people who could see it coming. Uh, that's true. I certainly wasn't one of them. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I think for the great mass of people, it, it is unbelievable as so he was saying about the attack on Chernobyl. Mm. Sahi, a a question for you. President Zelensky has made great efforts to reach out to the Russian public, whilst Putin has been quick to suppress protests, as as Polly indicated. To to what extent do Ukrainians and Russians still consider themselves as as different nations but one people? Is that still still possible to think of themselves as one people? Well, uh, first of all, I, I want to, to agree with what Anthony just said in terms of the shock of, of the war being absolutely psychologically unprepared. I'm talking about, about the, the rest of the world. And I would add that that unpreparedness meant that uh, not seeing even things that were right there in front of, 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 the, of the world world. Um, the public, the, the, the war really didn't start in 2022. The war started in 2014. With the annexation of the Crimea, that was the first case of the annexation uh, uh, of, by one country, territory of another country, after the World War II. But again, the, 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 the efforts, enormous efforts were made not to notice this, to, to continue business as usual. The, the, the uh, Nord Stream 1 was launched already, uh, and, and Nord Stream 2 continued. Uh, so, uh, again, the, 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 there was psychological unpreparedness to, 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 face, to, to, to face the truth, to, to see what was going on, because the truth was so, so inconvenient. And, and Putin was actually not hiding either his way of thinking or what he wanted to achieve, but people just watched uh, listened and and refused to believe. Um, in terms of the of the uh, Russians and Ukrainians being being um, the same people, maybe different states. That's certainly the uh, 
the uh, form of justification of the war that was put forward by uh, uh, Vladimir Putin, mm -hmm. but also one of the causes of uh, now Russian uh, surprise and, and Russian troops surprised that they are not greeted with flowers mm -hmm. as Putin promised them, but greeted instead with the weapons uh, and, and, and the, the Ukrainians are fighting back. The uh, myth about, about uh, Russian-Ukrainian unity or, or the, the sense of that unity to a degree that it existed Mm. Uh, before uh, February of 2022 is is dead. And it, it's not just that it has been killed. It has been killed on the daily basis with the bombardment of the cities like Mariupol, which is now almost, almost, again, there are 300,000 people left and, and, and the city is almost entirely in ruins the bombardment of the city of Kharkiv, all of these cities are in uh, Ukraine's east and south. They're Russian-speaking cities. That's where the percentage of the, not just Russian speakers, but ethnic Russians is the highest. Mm. And these people are bombarded and killed in the name of the Russo-Ukrainian unity. So that, that idea is certainly very much dead for mm. that part of, of, of Ukraine and, and for the rest of Ukraine as well. Finally, I wonder whether we can think about how this conflict, what this conflict might mean for the rest of the West and the rest of Eastern Europe in the coming decades. I know it's hard to, to be prophets, but if we were to look forward to the coming decade, what do you think the implications of this conflict might be for the West and the rest of Eastern Europe? Anthony? Well, I think it's not just for Europe, it's for the whole world. I mean, we're going to see a food crisis of staggering proportions. We are going to see, I'm afraid, a, a world recession. Um, China is going to be seriously affected, and this is why it's in a very, very difficult position, because of its own financial vulnerability at this particular moment, uh, with the vast subprime crisis, which dwarfs anything America had. That they could survive on its own, but that combined with the oil prices, and all the rest of it will have a vast knock-on effect. So, you know, what do they do? Do they stand by Putin or whatever, or do they try and rein him in? But um, to say that uh, Europe will be changed, yes, I think we've covered that to a certain degree earlier, whereby everything that Putin was seeking to achieve, the opposite has happened with the strengthening of NATO. Um, Finland and uh, Sweden working very closely with NATO, but not necessarily actually part of it. Um, and it means that any other country feeling vulnerable is, will be desperate to join uh, NATO. So he has certainly scored every own goal available to him. Uh, but that, of course, has only enraged him. Uh, where it will go from there um, is very, very hard to know whether there will be escalation, uh, whether he will go for Moldova or anything like that. Um, it is impossible to tell yet at this particular stage. But I think we are going to see, I'm afraid, a strengthening of the Russian position uh, due to a switch to strategy away from uh, their very ineffective tactics. But there's no doubt about it. Um, Europe and the whole world, to a large degree, will be very, very different. But uh, I think that the Western nations have got to do more to bring the South uh, in on their side because... Russia and China have such power and effect in Africa, uh, as well as uh, in certain parts of uh, South Asia, that um, the world is not necessarily as unified as we might like to think. I'd like to give the last word to you, Sahi. Uh, yes, I agree. The, the, the impact of the war is already uh, quite profound and significant on, on Europe and the rest of the world. And um, we started the, the discussion by uh, commenting on the question of whether we are at the, at the start of the new period, of the new era. Uh, I, I believe we are, and the impact that impact will continue. A couple of things that uh, come to mind on, uh, in addition to what, what Anthony just uh, suggested. Uh, one thing is that uh, we are uh, back to the division of Europe. It, it is very clear. So it's probably not the, the new Iron Curtain, but in many ways uh, the, 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 the divisions will be, will be even more 
clear and more profound because like it is happening now in Ukraine, they will come as a result of a very bloody war. Uh, in terms of uh, Eurasia, uh, clearly what we see is Russia uh, cutting ties uh, almost consciously with, with the West, with Europe and with the West in general, and uh, having nowhere to go but closer to, uh, to China, which certainly strengthens China's hand in, in, this, in this already very unequal relationship and alliance. So um, the, the world, which at least in terms of the economic power uh, and, and, and combined with military power, can be imagined today as three polar, maybe with the United States, uh, China and Russia, economically weak, but militarily strong when it comes to nuclear weapons. That, that world maybe will be becoming more bipolar, like it was the case during during the Cold War. Again, there will be no replay and repetition in the past the way how it, it happened, but we see we see a lot of a lot of signs that uh, the the uh, maybe the experiences that we as as a world as society learned through the Cold War will be in high demand now in the next in the next uh, ten years. And the main task is of course not to allow the third world war and, mm -hmm. and um, somehow manage this this new situation that uh, emerges as the result of the uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine. Thank you to Sehi Plocky, Anthony Beaver and Polly Jones for taking the time to talk to us. We'd also like to thank the Blavatnik Family Foundation for its generous support of this podcast. The Disasters Emergency Committee and British Red Cross are taking donations for the Ukraine Humanitarian Appeal online. If you'd like to support this, please visit redcross.org.uk. To find out more about the Bailey Gifford Prize, you can visit the website or follow us on Twitter at BG Prize. Do join us again to hear more from the world of literary nonfiction. Until then, goodbye. Read Smart, the Bailey Gifford Prize for Nonfiction podcast. This podcast is generously supported by the Blavatnik Family Foundation.